Well, today, uh, I just thought we'd hear from a couple of dads. So we've got four dads who are going to speak and just tell you a little bit about, each one's got a bit of a different subject. You know, there are, as I say, there are no perfect dads. We're all trying to do our best. And they're going to talk to you about, hopefully, some things that matter to you, that help you, that encourage you. So I want to ask Ashley Beard, who actually makes me feel inadequate. when he's, look, I mean, look at that. One of these things is not like the other. All right. Let's give Ashley a great hand as he comes. <laughs> I just have to sort of talk to the, get the feel of the, the, my voice. Um, so for those who don't know me, I, my name's Ashley. I've got my beautiful wife, Rach, um, and three kids. I've got Zana, who's eight, Eva, six, and Chetman, who's four, looking absolutely pumped. <laughs> uh, it was sort of, it was, for me, it was hard to think of particular father things um, to talk about, as for me and Rach, our parenting's always been a team effort. Um, you probably hear the term, I won't say me so much as I'll use the term we a lot. Um, I've never really felt like any particular part of parenting was just mine or just Rachel's, except the obvious biological stuff. Um, we, we try to make there be no gap between us that the kids can sort of get through. Um, and, and we do that just by talking all the time. Um, for me, I've, I've done like this little list slash guidelines of the way I've sort of approached parenting um, and obviously it's going to adjust as my kids get older and stuff like that. Um, my first thing is, is as a working dad, um, I, I've, one of the really important things I do is I just try and make sure I've always got time for them. Um, even, if, even if I'm tired after work, um, I know they miss me. Like I'll open up the front door and Chet will run to me. Um, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning to go to the gym so I don't miss my afternoon times with them. Um, I never want to get to that point where they stop getting excited about me coming home. Um, until they get idle, then it's just going to happen. <laughs> and I, I try and meet, meet each one sort of on their level. Um, so Zana will always, she loves soccer. So a great time for us to spend together is just going out the back and kicking a ball. Whereas Chet is either playing cards or Xbox. Um, and we can just sit and chat. Um, Rach and I, we're, we're a team in the afternoon as well. Um, so it's not, it's not like I get home, Rach feels like she's going to dump the kids on me or I go, oh no, I'm too, I've had a big day at work, you keep looking after them. Um, they're not a burden to us at all. Um, uh, our other one is, is a very important one for us is putting God first. Um, we set aside time um, to read to read Bible stories with them. We've got a kids' Bible and we've got a kids' daily devotion, which we'll do each night before bed. Uh, and then we can discuss the story that we've just read with them. Um, we're, we're encouraging prayer with our children from, from a young age. Um, and Sunday for us is church day. Um, we're trying to instill in them that, that God's not optional. So that they, as they get older, it's not a, oh, should we go to church? Do we have to? It's just, you put God first. Um, we'll always show more love than discipline. Um, kids, they're kids. They, they, they're going to misbehave. They're going to need discipline at some point. Um, but we'll always show them more love. That there's never one point after we've disciplined them that they're ever questioning whether we love them. Um, we show affection to each other in front of them so that they know it's normal. Um, um, when it comes to schooling, so our first two, they're still early school. Um, we're always encouraging them to try their hardest, to do as well as they can, just so that they've got as many options as they can later on. But it's not the be-all and end-all for us. Um, I am much happier to see in their report card that they're really well behaved, they're treating other kids really well. Um, uh, as a father in the family, I've sort of... I, I, my job for me, I suppose, is I'm trying to be an example. As opposed to telling them what a father should be doing, I'm exampling them. Um, 
I've always got to be careful about how I respond to situations as my children are watching. They're always watching. And they have an amazing ability to replicate exactly what you've just said. Um, I make sure, um, yeah, I, I'm exemplifying how a husband should treat his wife in front of them. Um, so, son knows, uh, so Chet knows subconsciously how he should be treating his wife. And my daughters know how they should be treated by their future husband. Um, and be ready for everything, anything. Like, um, I have this story with Chet when he was, would, would have been younger than what he was. And Saturday morning, they all come into our bed and wake us up. I try and get that 10 more minutes extra sleep. I should have woken up. As he's climbed up to come to me, he's fallen. And as he's fallen, his hands come out. I'm lying backwards. You have no idea how long a kid's finger is until it goes straight up your nose. <laughs> instantly awake, instant blood, scratch my brain. Oh, it was horrific. And children will just do, do, do absolutely random things. Um, Eva climbed three quarters of the way up um, her sister's bunk bed and then just let go, just <laughs> fell backwards. And there will be times when they're crying, you know they're hurt, you want to help them, but you're also sort of internally having this battle about whether you should go to them or if you should work out how they actually achieved their injury. <laughs> um, we're still... We're, we're still yet relatively young parents. We've got a lot to learn. Um, uh, and, and we're learning more as we go along. But we're very, very proud of our children um, and how they've achieved so far. Um, I'm, actually, I'm looking forward to hearing from the other dads um, with obviously much more experience than I have. Um, and I'll call Peter up now. Thanks. <laughs> Scarier here than hiding in, uh, behind the drum kit. <laughs> hey everyone, my name is Peter Rimulta. My wife, Che, and I have three girls. Danielle, 18, Matea, 13, and Maya, who is still 11. To describe my three girls, it would be something like this. One is an adult, but still unsure on how to properly become an adult. The middle, isn't, the middle child isn't an adult, but thinks and acts like the one. The next one simply ignores the dilemmas of the older two by playing Fortnite and making slime. With this in mind, teenagers go on a huge roller coaster of emotion, self-reliance and self-discovery. It's in these times that you as parents can steer and help them towards their God-given destiny. There is no doubt that as a child becomes older, parenting becomes harder. But from my experience, the teenager years are the perfect time to learn but about how your child is wired by God. Yes. Here are some of my experiences, what I've learned over the years when it comes to parenting a teenager. Being a parent of a teenager, I've learned to deliberate in my parenting and to be unafraid, unafraid in the discovery of my teen's full potential. When it comes to deliberate parenting, teenagers can, can have the opportunity to, to be influenced or to be influenced. As they go into high school and university, they met people that come many, in many backgrounds and upbringings. Be deliberate when you encourage your teen to be strong in their faith. I remember when the children were younger, we always told them that you can be friends with everyone, no matter the economic background, race, gender, sexuality, as long as it is not who you are being influenced by their views. The teenage years are the time when they begin to branch out and grow their social circles. So we always tell them that they should not be influenced by their friends. We'll remind them that no matter what, never, be, never to be afraid to stand for what you believe. Yes. Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world, a city built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Encourage your teenager to be set apart from the crowd. As your sons and daughters are exposed to opposing worldviews, they will look to you for moral direction. They need to know that there is a firm foundation of kingdom culture and truth that can stand on. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For no one can lay a foundation other than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Discipline. As they grow into teenagers, you can discipline them the way they were disciplined when they were young. In their journey to independence, give them space to exercise their freedom of choice. But on the other hand, we also make sure they know that actions can have consequences. 
when it comes to discipline. When it comes to discipline, assure your teen that they are loved and respected, that they know as a parent you are genuinely concerned and not lashing out on anger. Each family has some certain rules in place, and that's good. They need rules, and they should be followed without excuses. Parents, watch out with your rules, and remember that your intention should be to mold them and prepare them for the life ahead. One of the values that we impart on my kids all the time is to go to church every Sunday as a family. There are no excuses, even if they are busy with their studies and assignments. Get them involved in youth, youth camps, go to summit and life groups. Discipline is also role modeling. Let them see you serve and seek God first. When it comes to emotional connection with your teenager, it is based on quality time and quality conversations. Quality time is not how much time you put in, how, put in but how meaningful you make of the time. I remember when my girls were still very young, it was very tiring and exhausting coping up with their energy and excitement. But I love every moment of it. When I think about it now, I kind of miss it, as I cannot do it now that they're older. But we have another way of keeping up with our time together as a family. As a family, we cherish long car rides. My girls always blast out September by Earth, Wind & Fire, the new Hillsong Young & Free album, 80s hits, and lastly, Baby Shark song. We laugh and we have long chats about what's going on in their life, and this time of simply just being together in the car is valuable. Teenagers don't need a grand outing or holiday. They just need a little bit of quality time for their connection with you. Ask parents to grow stronger. Have dinner together every night. Go for walks. Serve at church together. Find time to build your relationship with your teenager. And lastly, invest in their passions. In the house, we talk about music all day long. When they were younger, the three of them used to jump together. This was the first time they explored their own musicality and creativity. But as they get older, they started to venture into new hobbies and skills. My wife and I would pray about every show that they were going into, pray for every role that they wanted to have, prayed for Maya's sporting events and Matea's academic goals. We make sure that they know God's will always prevails. I remember when my eldest was finishing high school, she had a huge audition and an interview coming up for a dream course. Before she went into the venue, we all prayed in the car for favor and peace. We told her to have her confidence in the Lord, and no matter what the outcome will be, God will always open doors when the season is right. Now that Danielle's part of, part of the course, this moment is a constant reminder of gratitude and faith in the Lord. As parents, we're responsible to lift them up to their God-given plan and ambitions. It is important to invest in your teenager's future, not just financially, but spiritually. Pray and sow your time into the things they love. This will allow your teenager to know that they are worthy and loved. Our core value is to serve God and give Him all the glory in all that we do. No matter what passion my daughters choose to pursue, my wife and I always highlight the importance of God to be the center of their lives. Although they are short-term fulfillments, they have kingdom value. You are deepening your child's faith and helping them explore ways to serve God. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's stewards of God's grace, in order that, in order that in everything God, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I grew up in a broken home and was raised solely by my grandma. I was an illegitimate child and never had any relationship with my biologi biological mom and dad. During my teenager years, I lived with different families and friends. I got born again when I graduated from high school. The church sponsored me to start university and live with my associate pastor's family for three years. It was in my stay with them where, where I truly experienced acceptance, love, and care. And although I wasn't biologically connected with them, they treated me equally as their own. In fact, the years that I lived with them was the time for me to vision a blueprint of what a family through Christ looked like. Even though my teenager years were challenging and difficult, my fear of not being able to be a father to my future children was healed. We have a loving father who cares about the relationships in our homes. He will provide the grace that you need. Happy Father's Day, everyone. And I will stage. Next is Steve Villiamo. Morning, church. Hey, look, everybody get up. I want you to clap along. I'm going to do a little rap for you this morning. Come on, get up. Start clapping. Here we go, because I've only got seven minutes. Get going. Uh, that's a bit fast. Okay, when I say a word, you've got to repeat it after me. So if I say E, you say merge. E, E. And when I say dad, you say rocks. Dad, dad, 
Oh, that's not bad, guys. I wrote this little ditty and I included Pastor Fred, so here we go. Keep clapping. Keep clapping. Here we go. My name is Steve Iliamu. I'm a father of five. I can't believe that I'm still alive. I got pupils on my left hand, glitter on my right. I don't know the, where the baby is and in my father, mother and I in fight. It's 9 a.m. and I'm ready for bed. I need help, Lord. I better call Pastor Fred. My kids are the greatest, or so I've been told, but still spitting dummies, 29 years old. Uh, the moral of the story is hang tough, Dad. But when they leave the nest, you won't be sad. Thank you very much to them. Okay, I, I got a photo of the frog of my lot if it happens. Um, look, I've been going to this church since 93. My wife and I have uh, five children. Josh, uh, Dan, uh, Jade. I keep looking behind me because I, I, I was going to throw a photo up. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Beautiful lot. You can tell a guy who doesn't have any kids, he's the one holding the baby. Um, that's, that's, that's Joshy. I'll tell you something. This lot will test you. I mean, uh, I think um, one of the things that uh, really impressed me about being a dad is that you don't have to be perfect, but they will perfect you. You don't have to be perfect but they will perfect you. They put on so much pressure and they've made me the man I am today. I'll tell you something. We had a pastor's visit uh, when I was a, 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 young, a relative young dad and my son Jeremy was five years old watching telly. It was about 6 p.m. and the pastors came around and we're sitting around the table and we're having coffee and talking spiritual things and Jeremy come running up, Dad, Dad. And everybody looked at him. What is it, son? My doodle just tingled. I said, oh, that's really good, looking at the pastor. What are you watching? Goodness. And I, I mean, kids will test you. They drive you nuts. Uh, uh, my, look, my son Dan, he's up in uh, Sherberg being a policeman. Uh, but when he was a younger guy, let me tell you, I thought there were police were going to arrest him. My, my uh, wife and I were at home one day and the police turned up. And him and his older brother had been in their little uh, first car, had these plastic toy guns, going squirting people with their water pistols. <laughs> the police came home and said, uh, your son has been doing this. So I had to take my son down and had some fatherly laying of hands. Um, <laughs> son, what, what are you doing? Anyway, he, he, uh, he's now serving as a police officer. There's a good luck to Cherbourg and good luck to Ipswich. <laughs> uh, my son, Do Josh, who's the oldest boy, he's the... He's the cool dad, good dude of the family. He's the model, much to the chagrin of his other two brothers. I think, and he's got a head like a drop watermelon. But look, he's he's all in these uh, photographs with, on Facebook. But I, I say all these things because the kids will test you. And as you keep growing up, you're thinking to yourself, "Wow, is it getting any easier or better?" And what's going on? They just keep continuing to test because they're five individual people, and. Um, my, my daughter is uh, J.D., beautiful J.D., she's, uh, she's married to her husband, uh, Billy, and uh, when she was um, going out, she, we used to fight because she's just like me, headstrong, you know, very, very much a domineering personality, and, and uh, look, she, <laughs> funny enough, she's a manager at one of the uh, fitness first stores on the south side, and she wasn't really that academically minded. She made, she was in the part of the class that made the top half possible. So, um, <laughs> um, she, she, she um, but look, and now she's the one who's got all these people that she's managed. She was the youngest uh, manager of the Snap, Snap Finish store, and she has done really, I'm so proud of it. So, um, but she also gave me some of the biggest headaches, and one day I, uh, I came to church, and we had this massive fight. You know, we'd just been going at each other because we're just these two, two people, just having a real crack at each other. And I walked into the church at night and I was just really frustrated and I knew I was right. And I had all the things <laughs> and, I, and I was just really, and then I, I just kept, and the Lord was starting to do something because I heard that song for the first time, Good, Good Father. <sighs> Sorry. I was really angry with that. And the song could say, good, good father. And I'm just going, man, Lord, this is a tough gig, tough gig. So I just uh, 
I texted her that there and then and I just apologised for what I did. Even though, oh, I just wanted to say that being right sometimes is really overrated. Yeah. Being right is just really overrated. <laughs> and and uh, so one of, the, one of the things that I really just wanted to say was that, um, that one of the guys have already mentioned it, is really to put God first. Yeah. Yeah. Put God first. Because when you're, when you're, when, if you're not preparing yourself daily, especially if you've got kids, you're just not going to be ready. Yeah. And that little... That little wave that comes to hit you is going to turn into a tsunami and it's going to wipe you out. You need to be in, in the presence of the Lord daily, especially if you're a parent. You need to be on your knees praying for them, waiting as they begin to grow. And you just got to, you know, don't wait until you're so desperate. Be desperate before you get to that position. Don't wait to be that position where you're so desperate that you need God. But if you are desperately seeking Him first, when the desperate times come, you'll be ready. And they're going to come. you just got to be ready. But, and the only way you can do that is prepare your heart, begin to, to just seek him daily. And I'm going to let you dads off uh, because I'll tell you something now. There is no such thing as a perfect father. But what happens is, I've said earlier, that fatherhood will perfect you. I don't know if it's more about me or them, but I just know that... Um, Without them, I know that I would be the same sort of man that I am today. And uh, I just uh, really just want to finish off with the thought that um, actually I read it from a book called, um, let me get it right, Man Enough, a book by Dr. Pittman, Frank Pittman. He wrote in it that uh, one of the studies that he studied, so many people, was that if you don't get anything else right, Dad, be present. This is, from a, this is from a non-Christian writer. He, all he said was one of the most, even if it's for a shortest period of time, be present, Dad. Be there for them. And I think as Christian dads, that if we can effectively do that, however, you know, you might have had the worst day. You just need to be present. Just make sure that you're there for those important times for your kids. God bless, church. Thanks, Steve. Okay, I'm last cab off the rank. And um, I just, I'm going to follow my script here, okay? So I think it's really important to make clear that by no means uh, am I a perfect father. Now, that's already been said, but it's true. I'm just as human as any father. And th some things I did well and some things I didn't. But one thing I do believe was really important for me is that my family and raising my children was a high, high priority in my life. So I'm going to start with a story that I, with, for you where I didn't do too well and lead into some others that I did a lot better. Uh, a little, first, a little background. I grew up in a non-Christian home. My father was absent emotionally and uh, later due to my parents divorcing. So I had little experience in what it means to grow up in a Christian home and with a father as a positive, present role model. Therefore, when I came to uh, being a father myself, I didn't really have clarity about what uh, this looked like. Therefore, I had inac inaccurate and unreasonable expectations of myself for what I should be. So I thought I should be this perfect authoritarian leader of the house. And so, therefore, I had a bit... Um, I didn't have... You know, wrong note. Uh, uh, this. So that led to frustration and anger at times, believe it or not, everyone. See, I told you I'm not perfect. However, it was actually when I used my strengths and I was myself and, and didn't try to be the perfect Christian leader in my home that things flowed and worked a lot better. So here's one example of something that didn't go so well. Family devotions. Mm. So, you know, family devotions around the dinner table where you, that's a really good idea and it, it's uh, a good thing to do. But in this, uh, for the Bedvilles, for this flawed man and this flawed family, it just didn't go too well. Okay. I tried many times. We'd sit around the table after dinner and I would, lead, I would read the scripture and then begin to discuss it. And then what would happen in two boys would begin to sabotage that <laughs> devotion. That, that seemed to be their goal. Anyway. And this dad, by the way, Shout out to my kids. I've got Caleb over there, 
Jason and Selena, so wonderful kids. And um, this dad got very upset. And rather than being a calm, peaceful time of instruction, where with a family sharing, it was very tense. And Selena told me yesterday that you could cut the air with a knife. Okay, so read between the lines, a very angry dad. So, uh, formal family devotions was a failure in the Bedville household, and so it had to go by the wayside. But, however, what we did do, and we, what we did try to do our best in, was to live our Christian life as parents in everyday life, trying to be consistent and authentic. And what, what we said and did at church, we tried to live out at home in front of our kids and with one another in our private world as well. What we lost in not having devotions with the kids, we still gain by us doing our best to live an authentic Christian life in everyday context. So, an example of where things went well. There was this time when the kids were fighting quite a lot and had a lot of negative talk and put-downs. So I used my gift of music and songwriting and I wrote a tune to the Bible verse, Ephesians 4, 29-32, which actually talks about not putting down and being help, using helpful words, not fighting but and forgiving. So we used to sing this together and we actually pasted it on the dining room table and on the pantry door and we had a reward for them when they memorised it and they learned it and the end result was that it did make a difference and the kids' words, attitudes and behaviour towards each other changed. So this was a natural thing that flowed rather than a forced thing where I was using my strengths and Selena still remembers the song. So, along this theme, I've often wondered why my kids develop such a wonderful love of worship. I did not push this with them. There were no formal times in the lounge room where we sat around and sang worship together. That just didn't happen. What I did do is that I had a pray, uh, that praise and worship has been my passion in my life, both at church and at home, privately. And I'm sure there was many a time the kids would have heard me singing in my bedroom to God and crying out to him in the times of difficulty. There were times I would take my guitar into the bedroom at night and just to say goodnight to them and, and we prayed with them and I would sing worship with them and, um, and also sing fun songs as well. This has oddly had an impact on them and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, just a few things that I'd like to share. I think it's really important to say sorry to your kids. And, um, it, it's, um, and that's been already been talked about. And it, sometimes we can think that they'll think less of us, but they won't. They'll think, they won't think less, less of us. Another thing we did, didn't do is we didn't talk negatively about church or church leaders or people in, in authority in front of them. And that's really, really important. Yes, we listened to them and when they had issues and problems, but, but we did not bring our issues to them. We discussed those privately. Spending time with them. One example is um, Caleb got, got into the V8 supercars. I was not into fast cars. I had a little Toyota Corolla. I, <laughs> so um, when I was my first car, but, but I got into that and now we talk about the F1s all the time and it's great. So... Um, when the kids were too old for kids' church, we encouraged them to volunteer in kids' church with us, and they started using their gifts. And it wasn't something that we planned to happen, it's just that they, their gifts began to come out. So Selena got involved in the music in kids' church, Caleb got along the kids, who, the challenging boys, and could do stuff with these boys that we couldn't do, he could get them engaged, and Jason found his niche with the little ones in the creche. So if you know Jason, that's him. Um, also peers. So um, what happened when we, came, we think we, our prayer and our priority for our kids was their friends and the friends they had. And by, as an example, when we came to Brisbane, uh, we came to this church and we were, our priority was that we found a church where our kids could connect first. We would find a church, we would be fine, but for them, we wanted a church that, where they would connect. And that definitely happened here and we're so grateful for that. So to finish up, I don't see myself as a super dad. What I do know is that I have sought to put God first in my life and with that I've seen my family as a high priority. I've used my gifts and strengths to guide my children and I really thank a wonderful faithful God who has blessed us in this. Fantastic. Come on, let's give our four dads a great hand. I just love the honesty of what just comes out. I just think it's just fantastic. They all did a fantastic job. 
They all said something that was just pertinent, that was just real. And it's just a blessing to be a father. So we're going to pray for our fathers. Maybe you could just come and play some mood music behind me, Jade. That'd be great. If you are a father in this place, I want you to stand up right now and we are going to pray for you. We are going to pray that the depth of relationship that you have with each one of your children, that's the thing that hits you when you're a dad. There's just no one way. It's not just one way with all your kids because they're all different. There's something different to do for each one of them. There's a different way that you connect. There's a different way that you can speak into their lives. And you know what? It doesn't matter how bad it is. If something's gone wrong, all of those things, something can happen from today. That's the great thing of Christianity. It's always a new day. There's a new thing. There's something new that God wants to do. You may have an area. You know, how do I connect with that particular child? God is a creative God. He'll give you a way. You want to find a place of connection. You want to find a place where they can listen. And so if you're here today as a father, we're just going to pray for you right now. If you're next to a father, put your hand on one of their shoulders and we're going to pray. Father, I just thank You, O Lord. Father, every father here, You are our Father, God. You are the perfect one, O God. And Father, each one of us are just trying to do our best trying to parent the way in which we can, O Lord. And I pray in the Name of Jesus that You, O God, that You, Father, would just give us the strength to be able to do what we call to do, O Lord. Father, I pray that we would be fathers better than where we are right now. But Father, also knowing that we are who we are. Use our unique strengths, use our unique personalities to bring the best out of our children, O God. Father, where there's not a, 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 a relationship right now, restore relationship, O oh Father, in the Name of Jesus. And let it be that this next year, this next year we would be closer. We would be closer to our children, more connected to our children where we are this year, O oh God. Father, I pray a blessing on every father in Jesus' Name. And everyone said, Amen. You can take your seats. Thanks, guys. You did a great job. I think it's very interesting that Father God is a very real concept. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray, His first words were to say, Our Father. If you can't see that God is your Father, then He's always going to be something else. That's how we come to God. He's our Father. There's relationship with Him. And when Jesus was trying to explain what the Kingdom of God was like, He spoke of a father who had two sons. One son wanted his inheritance right now, took it, spent it, wasted it. We all know the story of the prodigal son. But it's actually a story of the father. It's a story of the father who every day went and waited. His son wasn't doing what he wanted him to do. His son wasn't acting the way that he wanted him to act. But he still had this love. He didn't go try and rescue the son. He just waited for the son. And then one day his son came. And you can imagine God or imagine a father. He's been waiting there and one day he just sees. Oh, that looks like my son. But the things of sin, the different things had changed him a little bit. So he took a while and then he's came. And then he sees that it's his son. And he runs towards him. Doesn't run away from him. Doesn't sit there and say, well, until you've done all these different things, then I can accept you back. He goes, no, I accept you right now. That's the Father heart of God. And if you don't feel accepted today by God, I just want to pray with you. I want everyone to just close their eyes and just bow their heads. If there is a bit of disconnect between you and your Heavenly Father right now. That for some reason you don't feel that He's running towards you. That He's got a heart that's for you. I I wanna pray for you right now that that connection would be established. The Bible says He ran, fell upon His neck and kissed Him. Said, "Go, 
go kill the fatted calf. Put a robe on his back. Put a ring on his finger. My son has returned. That's the attitude God has for you today. 